when you are crisscrossing various fields and you mm -hmm. probably see mm -hmm. that yeah. as you are transitioning and asking other experts in other areas, you have to learn a lot and you really need to read, but you also need great mentors and meta mentors. And so I was extremely fortunate crisscrossing three continents to have superb mentors from various fields, cross-disciplinary components that actually have helped shape my you know, perspective, shape my clinical translational research. Hey everyone. And welcome back to another episode of Wellness at the Speed of Light podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Stefano Sinekropi. We have a very special guest today on episode number nine, Dr. Kirthi Sunder, who is board certified in psychiatry and addiction medicine. He is the author of the Amazon bestseller, Face Your Addiction and Save Your Life. He has a very unusual path to becoming a psychiatrist, uh, which we will dive into today, having first started as an OBGYN, and he's actually a diplomat of the obstetrics and gynecology of the Royal College uh, in uh, London. Uh, and eventually he went to Pittsburgh uh, to study uh, psychiatry, finished his residency there, has been in practice for a long time, and is currently at a practice called Karma Doctors in sunny California. Now, he is a huge advocate of women's health, uh, having been a previous uh, OBGYN, and he'll share some very interesting stories about his mom uh, and how his uh, thought process uh, changed uh, because of that. Uh, he is a uh, mind-body trained specialist. He is extremely interested in the connection between the mind and the gut, and we will discuss this on today's uh, program. He is highly trained and has written numerous articles on the utilization of transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is actually FDA approved and has been instrumental in helping so many people to overcome serious psychiatric difficulties. He was on the team in the development of uh, Newcom, which is an app uh, that can put us in better parasympathetic uh, states uh, by utilizing biurnal beats and is highly studied in the military uh, a setting and very excited to pick his brain on everything a new common app which I've actually been using for uh, quite some time uh, he has uh, appeared on uh, television programs he's appeared on uh, radio and again very highly published and so excited to have him today uh, on the program uh, with us most importantly before we start um, Everything you'll read about Dr. Sunder will let you know what a kind-hearted physician who really cares, but is also tremendously disruptive in his field and is doing so much to improve the lives of patients. Now, on that note, let's get started with Dr. Sunder, and I really hope that you enjoy this episode. Welcome, everybody, back to uh, Wellness at the Speed of Light podcast. We are extremely excited for this episode nine, where we have Dr. Kirthi Sunder on the show, who is a world-class psychiatrist. We're going to learn so much about him and how he's treating his patients in a very unique method of uh, integrative uh, psychiatry and has so much experience in so many different facets of mental health and just medicine in general. And we're really gonna pick his brain today. So Dr. Sunder, thank you so much for being on the show and, and agreeing to come on. I got, I'm glad we got our times uh, correct finally and, and got you on the program. Welcome. Thank you. Namaste, as they say from the deep wisdom traditions of India. And thank you, Dr. Stefano, for uh, welcoming me to your Wellness at the Speed of Light uh, podcast. I'm just, uh, I think here in California, we're still at the speed of sound. So uh, <laughs> we might just uh, need to work it out. Maybe we have to have a memorandum of understanding. There you go. Oh, we can do that. I'm a New Yorker. I'm always, I've been moving at the speed of light for a long time. We, we're, we're very <laughs> different from the Californians, by the way. Now I'm in Minnesota, so it's somewhere in between. But um, <laughs> no, welcome, welcome, welcome. I, I'm, I'm glad you're on the show. So I'd like to just start, you know, off, you know, what, what inspired you to 
really dive into the field of psychiatry. Was there something where your family was was deeply rooted in psychiatry? Did you have you know mental health in your family, or or what what spurred you to go into this uh, into this area? You no, know, thank you for that lovely question. You know, as you know, a lot of folks in medicine are inspired by something or the other. Uh, those who go into medicine. So I was no different. And uh, I will really, you know, give that to my mother, who suffered from quite severe depression to the extent that she was suicidal and uh, she received lifelong treatment. She passed away natural causes as about seven years ago. But I think that is what uh, inspired me to A, become a doctor because there are no doctors in either on my mother's side mm -hmm. or my father's side. They're all engineers and and so on and so forth. So I was really the oddball, but I was the youngest and I could see her suffering. She had bronchial asthma, she had concurrent depression. So it was one or the other, either there was a physical problem or a psychiatry problem. And growing up in India was back in the 60s. There was a lot of war at that time and so forth. And my father, who was a civil engineer, traveled a lot. And that resulted in a lot of other micro traumas, if you like, because we then had to relocate multiple times. And I think that impacted her health uh, over time. And it inspired me to first get in as an OBGYN. And uh, because I really thought that women's health needs to be addressed quite significantly. As you know, women disproportionately suffer more of challenges, yes. both trauma, yes. as well as mood disorders because of uh, reproductive transitions uh, that had happened in my mother's case as well, postpartum development of these problems. So it just really uh, was a linear mm. you know, sort of path for me Although for most folks, uh, they would assume that, you know, it must have been quite a transition to move from OBGYN, where you're operating and delivering babies, to jumping on to the other side of the body, which mm -hmm. is the brain. But to me, OBGYNs are primary care doctors, you know, women talk to them all the time about their problems and so forth, but they don't have the time and the training to address these problems and so forth. So it was a gradual transition. I was... Uh, very, very fortunate. And I must say, before you delve into every other aspect and, and um, you know, and ask me the questions, you know, in our deep, you know, wisdom traditions, uh, we always uh, pay obeisance to our mentors and teachers and mm -hmm. the gurus, if you like, uh, in, a, in a, you know, conceptual way. So I must say that were it not for mentors from India, I had a fantastic one, Professor Dwayti, Dr. Deepak Chopra, um, and uh, we've had many in England, Dr. Jonathan Evans, here in the United States, Professor Kathy Wisner, Dr. David Kupfer, Dr. Dan Sippel, you know, Dr. Ken Blum, Professor Kevin Murphy, all of them um, really taught me a lot because, um, you know, when you're crisscrossing various fields, and you mm -hmm. probably see mm -hmm. that yeah. as you are transitioning and asking other experts in other areas. You have to learn a lot and you really need to read, but you also need great mentors and uh, uh, and meta mentors. And so I was extremely fortunate crisscrossing three continents to have superb mentors from various fields uh, and the cross-disciplinary components that actually have helped shaped my you know, perspective, um, shaped my clinical translational research and also in building our particular practice uh, uh, in Palm Springs now, which is an integrative psychiatry and addressing what integrative psychiatry needs to be when it comes to one human being at a time. Well, thanks. That was actually, I mean, it was a, a beautiful answer to that that question. And it's just, it's so fascinating. I mean, that transition going from OBGYN to, to psychiatry and you bring up, you know, I'm a spine surgeon, obviously. And over the last couple of years, you know, although I am a full-time practicing spine surgeon, I have become so deeply enamored with the need. I mean, obviously, I'm partial to our country here, America, but but still, even in really in globally, the need to educate and to help people to understand that they need to be the CEOs of their own bodies, their own lives, and to try to prevent them from going down these very poor paths that lead to both physical, you know, and mental health issues. 
And the other thing I wanted to also mention is I'm a gigantic fan of Dr. Deepak Chopra. I've read many of his books. I think that he is, you know, nothing short of a legend, but just really brilliant and really understanding the way that the mind is so powerful in influencing the body. The concept of epigenetics is obviously, I know that you're big into that. And I've had so many guests on talking about how the external environment affects, you know, kind of the physical uh, expression of of what we look like, how we feel, you know, how we behave, how we act, and things like that. So yeah, thank you so you know, thank you so much for that. The transition that you made over to you know psychiatry with these great mentors, and yes, I think that without mentors, none of us would be anywhere near you know where what we've been able to accomplish and achieve. So I you know I'm always big on myself on mentoring other people. I know you are. I know you're a big yeah. mentor to, to to many many people. But when you transitioned over to the psychiatry world, what was the most difficult thing for you as far as how did, did you have to shift your mindset a lot in order to do that and not think, I don't want to say not think like an OBGYN. I mean, we're all physicians. We we all yeah. sort of are, have, but, but how was that shift? Because to me, psychiatry, like when I was in med school was so foreign. It was such a, it was so different. Than, than kind of, you know, giving drugs and, and all that other stuff that we do and doing procedures and things like that? No, I think that's an outstanding question. Um, I was very fortunate that I was training in England and there it was possible for me, believe it or not, to continue to deliver babies uh, at some point and then still do a rotation. And they are so ahead of the game when it came, comes to community psychiatry. I think we in America needs, need to learn more with regard to how several other countries do mental health better than we do mm -hmm. um, and so forth. We certainly do many other areas so uh, well that, um, you know, no one can catch up if you like. Uh, so I feel very, you know, blessed and happy and proud about that. But I think in mental health, we are getting there. But I had the opportunity, uh, you won't believe they have discrete mother and baby psychiatry units. They are perinatal psychiatry units. Each oh. district will have one of them. And so the maternity hospitals will seamlessly connect through community midwives and community psychiatry nurses. They'll all work together. And so if a mother is in the postnatal ward depressed, they'll immediately refer and they'll be able to room in in the mother and baby unit, you know, and so forth. We don't have that luxury in the United States, except I think one center in North Carolina and a mother who is depressed and has a baby, you know, has to really get admitted to a general psychiatric hospital where it is, you know, you need the attachment, you need all of those components. So to your point, I think uh, it was a relatively smooth transition. Also, because it is a socialized system and so on and so forth, therefore, there's an openness about cross-disciplinary components and that every other uh, speciality is just as equally important. They're not competing, you know, so competition can sometimes create challenges, you know, because you have a lot of, um, how shall I say, silos, if you like, and so forth, and they don't talk to each other seamlessly, and so on. So uh, whilst it was interesting transition for me, moving from a, an acute surgical practice to a psychiatric practice with no hands-on work, but I think I felt strongly that at the end of the day, I remember asking my mother about this, that, you know, I'm going to move from, you know, what is considered a relatively happy speciality, you know, and so forth to a more dark space, if you like. And, you know, she had transitioned. She said to me, well, you know, everything begins from there, right? So no, no matter how you see it, I think the origins of whatever our problems are and so on and so forth, all the oscillations uh, that happen in the body and so on and so forth happen when the brain and the mind. And therefore, for me, I think I just am so happy that everyone's coming around to, you know, this concept that stress is key and we can manage 90% of the problems as we were discussing earlier, if we can avoid going into the hospital, you know, and so on and so forth and really take care of ourselves systematically and, and so forth. And, you know, I think 
our bodies are intelligent, nature is intelligent, and we are you know, blessed to have that, but we need to be able to know and have those tools. And I think I'm looking forward to us discussing some of what we are doing and some of what you're doing in terms of really wellness um, so that the need for acute care is in acute situations where you will need that, you know, trauma, for example, a heart attack, and so on and so forth. But most of the other things, such as metabolic syndrome and other, you know, problems like addiction and problems like PTSD can be addressed with a lot of the other tools that are available. And there's so much supportive science related to that. Yeah, you know, a hundred percent, everything you said. So one of the things that I've really been focused on and I wish I had like I, I wish I had thought about this earlier in my career. I was just so focused on doing, you know, obviously the right surgeries, being cutting edge and spine surgery, doing minimally invasive motion preservation, all those things that you hear about. I'm sure you hear about it too, because the, the, that's what spine surgeons talk about, and and people are acutely aware of of needing spine surgery or different types of spine surgery, or endoscopic, all this stuff. But what I didn't focus on personally as a physician or, or really dial into was the fact that we are really very good, like you say, at acute care management, or if somebody has like a significant structural problem in the spine or in their foot or, or you know, they have something that they need an operation on like, uh, you know, GI cancer. Obviously, that needs to be handled for now, for now with with yeah. with Western Irish medicine. But as you and I talked about before, twofold things. Number one, the we're using Western medicine ideas, which are amazing. I mean, we're very good at it, but we're using that in in a big, big percentage of how we're treating patients. And that might not be optimal. So it should probably be a lot smaller percentage of the pie. Because and, and it's it's not that we're trying to take it away from our colleagues, including myself, who's a spine surgeon. It's because it it is not some of the tools don't work for things like metabolic crisis. Like you can't fix those things with a one molecule solution is what we're trying to do, so on and so forth. And then the other thing that you mentioned, which is so true, and I've said this. On my podcast, I it's on my LinkedIn. I'm I'm real ninety percent of metabolic of the metabolic crisis, which is completely out of control right now, is absolutely preventable. So I did a a post on LinkedIn where I sat next to these guys. They were talking about the patients in the medical ICU. These are great doctors. Like their level of care. If I'm in the medical ICU, I want those guys. But yeah. the funny thing is, I asked the question, are they asking the right question? The question might not be like, well, obviously you need to take care of them, but it's not like, oh, you know, what's their creatinine? What's this? When are they going down to? The question is, why are these people here? What were the last 10 to 20 years like to get them to this point? And so I think that as physicians, and that's why I'm so excited to be talking to you, because I know you're at the forefront of so many of these different things, is we really need to figure out a way that we can educate the public and our, and our colleagues on the need for integrative wellness preventative approaches other than treating the downstream effects of 20 years of mismanaging this beautiful human machine that we've been gifted, right? And so on that note, my question to you would be, how frustrated personally, you know, are have you been in seeing how the metabolic health crisis is completely out of control and how not only it's affecting physically, but mentally and people might and people are not understanding the causes of it, and they're maybe not going down the appropriate avenues of treatment to seek care for these conditions. Yeah, I think that's an you know outstanding summary of the problem we have. But at the same time, I think you and I would agree that we have effective solutions. And I certainly think the social media has been fantastic. And I'm so glad you've started the podcast and coming from you know, a surgeon and uh, being a former surgeon and so forth, and we were both in that wellness space, if you like, and to address it in multiple ways and to look at how is modern cutting edge science providing us tools in this day and age to actually address wellness 
at the speed of light, um, if I might borrow, because our lifestyle is at the speed of light. And therefore, our challenge is that we cannot all go to the beautiful, you know, sanctuaries in India, for example, and sit and meditate, you know, and, and so forth, and have the luxury of having sabbaticals, even in the United States, and so on. Life's, life is busy. And that is why lifestyle medicine, lifestyle psychiatry, and so on and so forth have, um, you know, an important role to play. So uh, to your point about my own journey with regard to traditional psychiatry and practicing that actually led me to think about these solutions. Because as I was mentioning earlier, I was uh, working at the veteran facility in San Diego and uh, have a deep you know, love and affection for the veterans who provide us these freedoms that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, as you know, they have a lot of problems related to anxiety, depression, and PTSD, high rates of suicide and addictions and so forth. Uh, but it struck me at that point, actually, that these are some of the smartest, highly disciplined human machines. Okay? So you're not taking the person who's not been that disciplined in life. You're taking machines who are like so good at taking care of themselves. So we can see how stress impacts the body. Not only does it impact the brain, the mind, but it also impacts the gut. And we'll be talking a little bit about that. And so what happens is this human machine now becomes extremely vulnerable to everything that you talk of, which is epigenetic insults, mm -hmm. mitochondrial dysfunction, gut brain dis dysregulation. And so it's a very slow process and give it mm -hmm. 10 more years. And now you have someone who's walking around with a phenomenal amount of stress and it doesn't help to your point that we have regulatory concerns um, with regard to our food uh, that mm -hmm. we you know, consume and the fact that, you know, we have several other components that facilitate a lifestyle, including being sedentary, you know, not having enough, if you like, time off in order to be able to take a break, mm -hmm. you know, in many countries, there's paternity and maternity, you know, time off, if you like. You mm -hmm. see, it's not frowned upon uh, and so forth. So from a perspective of how we should approach philosophically the, the societal components, that's one piece of it. And then, of course, the entire training component so that the future doctors come out understanding that preventive medicine is just as important as, you know, your interventional medicine, right. interventional surgery. And in fact, Dedicated time with regulatory bodies, giving us plenty of time for, you know, preventative work, you know, that is also just as important for us to be able to take that on so that, like you mentioned, in the ICU setting, it should be possible either for someone who's like a health coach or a wellness coach or yes. a wellness nurse to sit in with them before they get discharged to say, you're at risk for more of the risks associated with metabolic syndrome, let's work with you seamlessly and so on in order to get you to a point that in 12 months time, you will be the epitome of, you know, wellness at Love the speed it. of light, you know? <laughs> so there you have it. Yeah, I think it's just frustrating like you said, because it is a very slow process and people don't see it and it's the environment that they're around. So we always talk, I mean, I always say the same stuff. If we have a toxic food environment. We have environments where we're managing most things with medication management without sometimes having any idea what the root cause is. It's just true. I'm not saying things. I mean, you're in the wellness space. You, you, you understand that. And then the frustration with, you know, I went to an amazing, uh, you know, institution for my training. And yet the amount of time that we spent talking about nutrition, health, yeah. wellness, prevention was tight. It was so fractional. I can't even remember it. I can't tell you if I had an hour of training in that. I'm being honest. I mean, I remember 
amazing pharmacology lectures and neurology and surgery, all this am like just amazing profession. But I don't remember anyone saying, hey, do you know what the uh, importance is of uh, keeping vitamin D levels at a certain amount or, yeah. or keeping the hormones of stress at bay? And this is what can happen to the rest of your body going forward. So excellent Definitely excellent point. I've been become extremely, extremely interested in this concept of lifestyle medicine and psychiatry. You know, I've, I've people are asking me now why I continue. And now I'm talking a lot about depression, PTSD, yeah. and these other symptoms. I talk about it all the time, and and everyone's now everyone's confused. They're like, "You're a spine surgeon. Why are you so?" Because it's it's so so critical that our population just like you said it beautifully is moving at the speed of light takes a pause and starts thinking about getting the brain in order and also their gut we'll talk about that later but getting the 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 brain because those hormones we talked about another show those hormones of stress are so different than the hormones of love the brain can produce such a powerful cocktail of things that can actually heal us so it's just a beautiful, beautiful organ, which is why I'm I'm so excited and why like getting uh, you know somebody on like you is it's amazing. And two years ago, I would have never thought I'd be talking to somebody like yourself about these very topics. And now this is really what's at top of mind because I talk to my patients more and more all the time. They need people like you, like they need the next breath. I'm being honest. I mean, it it yeah. is a disaster in as far as people's mental health and what and how they're getting cared for and those types of things. So I think it would be great for our audience to learn about what is different with like what we could say things like integrative psychiatry as opposed yeah. to more of a traditional approach. Can you talk about that? No, thank you. It's a beautiful way to segue into the work that we are doing as well and to educate the audience about integrative psychiatry and integrative wellness overall, and why actually every human being in the United States and the world should actually empower themselves. We have so much knowledge on the internet and, you know, through the social media. It's just a matter of uh, filtering the noise and focusing on the yes. signal. So I think I'm very grateful to your podcast that is, how should I say, laser focused is probably the way to say it, to sort of introduce topics that folks are able to then say, you know, this is interesting. Let me research this yes. and let me see if it applies to me and let me consult with those folks and pick up the phone and call and ask about it so that I just don't go down that route where I will need acute care. And if I do need, then I'll take it. But after that, I'll do more wellness. So I'll keep consolidating my wellness and so on and so forth. So in our, you know, sort of clinic setup, which is in Palm Springs, we sort of looked at what had led us to this particular path, which is going through the traditional realms of prescribing medications, doing psychotherapy, and, you know, really grateful to the masters who taught some of it. And that is just as important. So we do run a psychiatry practice because we wanted to be able to say that we need to address the masses, you know, and so on. We need to educate everybody. Therefore, we take the time within our setup to educate everyone about wellness. And we try and say if the medications are needed for a certain period of time in certain disorders, use the minimum effective dose that causes the minimal side effects. But do a lot of lifestyle component. And to your beautiful point about vitamin D, for us, it is critical in depression, you know, in everything that happens with the body and so forth, that people get out and about. Even if they are depressed and they can't get out and about, we encourage them to take baby steps. You know, we check vitamin D levels. We provide good quality supplementation. And then we measure on a periodic basis. We encourage them to exercise because it introduces and enhances BDNF, the brain-derived neurotropic factors, you know. We focus on trying to get their metabolic syndrome better in check. We work with their GI doctors and endocrinologists and primary care. We are very integrative in that regard as well, which is we are collaborative with the primary care and other providers 
and we take the time, we conduct events in the community and we welcome them so that they can learn what we are doing. And we can tell them that if you are time pressed, we will do some of the counseling and so on and so forth because the patients are coming to us. We have the expertise in doing motivational interviewing and intervening to get them to move from where they are in a contemplative, pre-contemplative stage to action stages so that they start shifting into that particular gear. So what happens with all of this cumulative approach is we don't also recognize that, you know, we recognize that we can't dish all of this in one day. I think that is a part of the problem in the current system of how the CPT codes are and how, you know, doctors have to just continuously see patients and so forth. So in our setup, we have technology-based practice where we use cutting edge tools that are FDA approved and have robust research. And we have this wonderful, if you like, six week you know, period where we are able to address it. For those who have severe depression and uh, PTSD with depression and so forth, they're able to come for transcranial magnetic stimulation. And in that setup, we really are able to pull together all the components, whether it's the body, whether it's the brain, whether it's the mind, we're able to address it. And therefore, we get outstanding results because of that. Fantastic. I think I'd like to get into the TMS because you 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 brought it up now. You know, one of the things we're doing in our wellness centers, and there is some frustration around, you know, what things are FDA approved for and what they're not. So, for example, like photobiomodulation, as you know, is, is, is FDA approved for, for musculoskeletal issues and for pain but not necessarily FDA approved for things like depression and anxiety disorders and other things. But yet there is copious amounts of literature out there that, that clearly show the benefits of photobiomodulation, especially some of this transcranial work that's being done at Massachusetts General Hospital. I mean, it's just brilliant stuff, but yet there is such a slow process of integrating this, these low cost effective methods and it's been a frustration to me because I see things that are getting approved by the FDA that are hugely expensive. And the studies show maybe at the margins, you're getting somewhat of a benefit. And it, it just, it's been frustrating. So I'm very excited that transcranial magnetic stimulation is, is an FDA approved thing for, you know, the conditions you're treating it for and something that, you know, we're interested in looking at and bringing into our wellness centers because it, you know, it's, it's just a fascinating technology and your research behind it, you and everything is going to take us as physicians proving it because people are skeptical. They don't believe, but not only that reversing, if somebody's 40 years old or 50 years old, that's 40 to 50 years of hearing about the same stuff. So that's what they know. So when the people listening to this, they hear transcranial magnetics, what in the world is that? 99.9% .9 of the people that are going to watch or listen to this podcast, no clue what it is, just like when I told them about class four laser therapy or the other stuff that we do. So can you give us the 101 on transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation, uh, how it affects the brain, talk to us about um, you know, how you evaluate it and some about your uh, the research that, that you've done on it, which I've had the, the privilege of, of going through. It's really fascinating with great results, but go ahead. No, thank you again, Dr. Stefano, on this point about uh, skepticism. Uh, I think, you know, uh, I guess that you can say that there is healthy skepticism and there's unhealthy skepticism, you know. So I guess that this is where our audience now have to really recruit their emotional intelligence because we've got the intelligence and so forth. And we have to drop some of the suspicions that we have and we have to train ourselves in order to be able to review what is being spoken and what is out there and take the experts and you know their assistance in order to sift through all of it and then say, okay, this works. And we may not have countless years to wait until all the data related to you know right. hundreds of randomized controlled trials come through with hundreds of thousands of patients and so on and so forth. So TMS is a very good example of that, that was not multi-center, multi-country research that led to the FDA approval. And TMS stands for transcranial, which is between the two magnetic stimulation. And simply put, everyone is familiar 
with the fact that when you push electricity through a magnet, you know, you will have the generation of the pulses that will then can lead to electrical activity. It's the Faraday principle of electromagnetism. And everyone is aware that in depression and psychiatry, ECT or electroconvulsive therapy, with all of its controversies and all the good things that have come up with it, has been used. You know, so everyone's familiar with the most lay person who's not familiar with psychiatry knows that you can shock the brain. So TMS is simply a gentle way of introducing electricity. Thank goodness for all of the scientific research that preceded the FDA approval, you know, and so forth. Tons and tons of, you know, engineers and scientists who came together to recognize that electrical activity. And my mother had received ECT back in the 60s and so on. And um, so it does help. However, it has many problems. You know, you've got to be hospitalized, you need anesthesia, you know, and so forth. You can get side effects from it and so forth, but it's still used and, and so forth in those intractable conditions where uh, n nothing works essentially as an augmentation strategy. So TMS, since it's FDA approval, uh, there are more than five manufacturers now, that's the good news. And you have hundreds of thousands of these machines across the world. And that is even more beautiful. And there have been multiple iterations beyond just administering it in a standard way. And in fact, there's a slide that was sharing with your team on the evolution of uh, the TMS and how it has evolved. And we have been fortunate to work with some of the pioneering researchers in this field who came up with personalized repetitive TMS and so forth. And that allows us to map the brain with a dry electrode EEG device. Mm -hmm. And there's a slide related to that as well. And that takes about barely six to seven minutes. Mm -hmm. It's painless. With that, we're able to capture the electrical activity of the brain and get patterns. What's beautiful in the last 10 years, and even prior to that, quantitative EEG has been a part and parcel of neuropsychology work yeah. and neurofeedback work, as you know. Again, not FDA approved for the, um, you know, for treatments, but you have plenty of neurofeedback centers that you use quantitative EEG. So it's wonderful that now it has been possible to study various types of patterns that you can see in various disorders. I wouldn't have thought 30 years ago, given that most of psychiatry, most of mental uh, illness and so forth, we just ask a question. How do you feel today? On a scale of one to 10, 10 being the most sad, how sad do you feel? You know, those standardized questionnaires are part and parcel of psychiatric research today that has led to, you know, the FDA approval of psychiatric medications. And, but on the other hand, I think the field needs to move forward to capture more of the electrical activity that's at the core of the brain's, you know, communication systems and the neural networks, if you like, the way the nerve cells are talking to each other. So that is something that several researchers have started to compile and with that, a decade of that data that has come through, we now are able to see patterns. And there's a slide related to the patterns that my mentor, Dr. Murphy, has uh, kindly shared. And we have collected some of that in our own lab and clinic as well. And that's the data that we've started to publish with some of the premier you know, uh, research institutions, including scientists who are working with us to collect more of this data. Mm -hmm across the lifespan from neurodegenerative conditions like autism mm -hmm. to mild cognitive impairment to human performance, not just in disorders, but even wellness across the lifespan. Why? Because we know that the brain works with brain waves, if you like. When the nerve cells are all firing away, mm -hmm. they are also getting wired. As they say, the nerve cells that fire together, they wire together. And so if you think about conditions like depression, anxiety, PTSD, concussion, and so on, those nerve cells have suddenly started to fire at a different frequency, okay? That electrical activity basically is shown in brain waves, the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, theta. So the coherent brain, it oscillates in the eight to 12 hertz of alpha. And from time to time, it will recruit. For example, we both are talking today. So obviously we are conscious, it's daytime, and we are thinking and so forth. So we are in a beta, you know, brainwave activity because we are thinking consciously and so forth. Now, if we wanted to relax deeply and so forth so that we can actually come up with creative solutions to the problems, 
we need to be in the alpha and also in the theta zone where basically you get into deep rest and healing happens. So most of what is happening in life today when we are going at the speed of light and so forth, and we are basically just about at the verge of having an accident at the you know traffic lights, if you like, and so forth, just about and so on. So there is where we need new tools and technologies that have the FDA approval and so forth, but maybe they have to be used off-label in order to study it, number one. Number two is we need more robust research, therefore, other centers and so on and so forth should take this on and investigate it further so that we get more data with regard to efficacy, such as, for example, you mentioned about photobiomodulation. You know, we know light and sound, you know, these are energetic forms that affect our energy. We know sunshine affects us. If you only stayed, if you look at the rates of suicide in countries like Norway and so on and so forth, the higher rates of suicide because they stay in darkness for longer periods of time. You know, yes. so we are aware of the importance of light. The migration of human beings uh, when they retire is very rarely, you know, and, you know, I will not uh, put you on the spot about Minneapolis <laughs> and so on and so forth, but it's extremely rare that someone chooses to, to uh, you know, um, less sunshine. They migrate towards Florida, they migrate towards Texas or, and so on and so forth, California. And I think it's a natural propensity as your vitamin D levels are depleting and so on and so forth to seek it, you know? So think about it. Um, so I believe that when you think about uh, the interventions that we are, you know, utilizing, all of them are FDA approved and so forth. And we are continuously collecting data and so on. And we are introducing several other um, modalities that have, you know, increasing evidence mm -hmm. to augment that. For example, gut brain, we talked about the fact yes. if you're stressed out, you're basically going to have a problem with a leaky gut, your intestinal lining, because you're not eating right and so forth. So if you're not eating right and eating all the other things that are going to basically have trans fats like French fries and so on and so forth, and what have you, which you will, if you're stressed out, you know, you'll seek, you know, uh, comfort foods it's going to basically affect your intestinal lining. In such a situation, you might need probiotic help, good quality probiotic because you need good bacteria. That may not have the randomized control gold standard trial right. data. You know, we can't, because it's difficult to conduct, you know, nutritional, you know, trials involving millions of people considering the challenges uh, of collecting stool samples and testing for them and so on and so forth. Yet Professor Emran Meyer at UCLA has done some of the most neat research related to yogurt and probiotics and so forth. It is yes. worth basically looking at that. It is informing us that we need to, in simple cases, just change our diet and add, you know, you know, probiotics, sauerkraut, you know, and other things that basically kimchi and so on and so forth that have the you know, propensity to help with good bacteria. But there are cases where you'll have to test for a leaky gut because if you're constantly having problems related to anxiety, stress, and no amount of medications are going to, have, you know, help with that and so forth, you will need to confirm it by seeing an integrative GI doctor, integrative physician, and then you need to heal that with the correct, you know, supplements and so forth. And that combination approach, I think, will need to be done on a you know, continuous basis across board from the seriously ill to those who are somewhere in between to the people who are well continue to be well. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a great answer. I mean, that's one of the things that we've been talking about a lot, not just on the show, but but in, in social and something I've become a, just a, you know, rapidly passionate about is the microbiome health and how it can affect you know, the brain, I mean, 90, right. The serotonin is primarily produced in the, in the gut the and that, and that right feeds right into the whole pleasure reward center and the whole reward deficiency syndrome. So if you, if you screw up, you know, your serotonin production in the gut, you know, it's a disaster, but just looking at the fact that your microbiome is kind of like a, a summary, right? Because it's even in like households, 
like certain households have certain microbiome patterns and then certain That's neighborhoods have a microbiome pattern. Yeah. And then depending on what country you're in, you have a microbiome and it all affects our brain. And it is such fascinating research. Some of it is so early because not only like, if you look at the microbiome of the gut, but they're also now, I mean, I, I was reading some papers on microbiome health that they're studying now, like in the bladder, you know, causing some things like cystitis, which in, and you're as a former OBGYN, oh, always an OBGYN, mm -hmm. I guess, if you're an OBGYN, you're an OBGYN for life. Like, but <laughs> I mean, these women that suffer from things like cystitis, yeah. If we can start tying it back to microbiome health in their gut and in their bladders and have treatments that target those things, strangely enough, not only through those supplements, but also through, you know, vibrational medicine and some of these other things that are coming down the, the pipeline. I mean, those are kind of farther down the road. It's as fascinating that, that you bring that up about, about microbiome health. I'd like to ask you on the microbiome thing when you say and we talked about it a little bit before the show but are there specific um species of probiotics that you recommend for your page like do you have a a very specific protocol that you can basically broadly prescribe to people that look like they have you know leaky gut or or is it it or do you tailor your probiotic protocol based on results of stool samples and actual you know, testing of their of their microbiome? It's an excellent question, you know, and I'm asked this all the time, uh, given that we do integrative psychiatry and we've had a deep interest in this, what we call as the bi-directional gut-brain neuromodulation. You know, there's actually a um, nice uh, uh, cartoon video uh, that I have shared with your team on the little brain, big brain, you know, and uh, believe it or not, there is a a uh, wonderful society, uh, neurogastroenterology society called the Little Brain, Big Brain Society. We talked about it, LBBB, and um, courtesy them and our team, we created a video that actually shows um, that um, the body, you know, never lies, you know, and um, which means that very early on, if you've had deficit, conflict, you know, um, and challenges, trauma, or you have adversity because of race or gender, or you've had adult-related trauma, like war-related trauma, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what we are finding. And this was published in um, the uh, Nature Gastroenterology Reviews because they've started to look at this, that your epigenetic transformation is not only going to happen in the brain with the brain gene expression, you know, as Dr. Ken Blum talks about that, you know, you have the dopamine reward genes that are affected because that's how you start seeking, you know, attachments in the dysfunctional manner and actually taking rewards with alcohol and other things. Because when you have early trauma, brain gene expression is changed. The dopamine reward deficiency syndrome gets affected and you start seeking, you know, things that are going to basically affect your brainwave activity. It gets off basically you're no longer in alpha you have too much beta and too much gamma or too much delta and theta so you get a very mixed pattern now take that into the gut because as we talked about the gut has got 90 percent of everything that you need and so forth so you now have gut expression as well why because as that little video will show there is actually a freeway that goes it's the vagal afferent that wandering mm -hmm. nerve we learned in med school, you know, vagal nerve, it goes back and forth between the gut and between the brain. And so there are efferents and afferents. That means the freeways go both ways, basically, you know. And so you're going to have this communication of stress related changes, both in the brain as well as in the gut. And they're going to talk to each other. And basically, they're going to change the healthy bacteria that are there in your tummy. Mm. Bad bacteria, the bad guys will take over, you know? Yes. And so then food that should not cross the gut barrier will start crossing. And, and then you become more, more sensitive. You were probably never sensitive to gluten or to lactose or to, you know, other things like egg and so on and so forth. But you might suddenly say at 10 years from now, 
you know, t- 10 years later, you see that you've started to become sensitive to food. Mm, yes. When you eat this, you feel bloated or you feel sleepy or you get spots all over and so forth, your joint pains and so on and so forth. And that's because you're having signs of a leaky gut. It doesn't show itself like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, but they all have a basis in stress. They have a basis in basically gut gene expressions and so forth. So that is why all of this new development with regard to taking bone broth to heal the gut lining, yes. you know what I'm saying, and uh, L-glutamine to heal the gut lining, yes. probiotics. And to your question about, is there a broad base? And this is something even Professor Meyer has addressed, that I think the first focus has to be dietary and so on and so forth, so yes. that you can start introducing more of the foods that will basically start populating because there's just so many different types of good bacteria. So this kind of a change that has happened, you want to alter it with just altering some of that. The other thing I will say in most cases that come uh, to us that experience anxiety and stress and sleep problems and so forth, we use um, other technology like Newcom, and we'll be talking a little bit about that, to modulate the stress. And as I mentioned, the highway between the brain and the gut is the vagal nerve, the parasympathetic nerve. Yes. And what is the stress one? It's basically the sympathetic system. So we need to know that the body, because it never lies and it stores the stress, that's why when you go to have a good massage and somebody who's very you know, well-trained and so forth, presses on certain points, you feel, ouch, you know, what was that? You see what I'm saying? Because, of course, the body is storing the stress. And that's why we even recommend that people should have periodic massages and so on and so forth because of the fact that you actually store so much of all of this toxicity in your body. Now, I was talking about this, that when you start to use technology that is evidence-based that can actually put you into a parasympathetic tone, a vagal balance, if you like, slow your sympathetic nervous system down, your communication pathways between the gut and the brain, they become better regulated. There is a better chance for the good bacteria to start populating. And you start getting the messages when you stress out that let me be responsive as opposed to reactive. And let me not go after that donut. And let me not go after that alcohol. And with that, you start healing the gut. So therefore, a piece of it is definitely diet, and a piece of it is also probiotics, but a piece of it, a big piece of it is stress modulation, you know, with technologies that can, in this, you know, fast-paced world, help you to basically give you restorative sleep, and during the day, put you into a vagal tone. Um, And lastly, to your point about the type of probiotics in order to get the bacteria going, in general, you know, you've got um, lactobacillus bifidus as well yes. as, uh, um, you know, bifidophilus and so forth. Uh, they are the most common ones that uh, essentially are recommended. But we tend to say that if we get patients who really have problems um, that have to do with irritable bowel syndrome mm-hmm. or they have chronic constipation, uh, getting a lot of intermittent stomach pain, you know, and so on and so forth, heartburn and what have you, we just typically recommend go over to an integrative gastroenterologist and get tested because there are ways to test the leaky gut, you know, and so forth. And there are blood tests, stool tests to test for it and so on. And once you test it, then you know um, what else you need to add to basically customize it and personalize it. So at our practice in general, we start to recommend folks about making alterations and so forth, including helping them with a metabolic syndrome, reading about intermittent fasting and so on and so forth, utilizing it in an intelligent fashion so that they can start to actually make some headway with regard to um, their gut and brain issues. Oh yeah, that's fantastic. That was great. I think you you summarized it in a way that is really you know easy to understand. The one thing that we didn't touch on, I asked you the question about the prebiotics, but one of the things I, t- I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry, the probiotics, but one of the things I talk to my own patients now that I do kind of a combination spine surgery visit, wellness visit, 
which some people are surprised about. My new patients are like, why is this guy counseling me on my obesity? I said, well, so, you know, somebody's got to do it. But anyway, so one of the things is like on the, on the prebiotic side, you know, you mentioned bone broth, but there, you know, things like, so I just tell them that having things that have natural fibers or having fiber supplements, you're feeding the happy guy, you know, the ones that you want to feed, you're feeding the good guys. But when you're having your, you know, your second Frappuccino of the day to wash down that Kit Kat, you are absolutely, I mean, those, those bad bacteria, you know, the E. coli's and all the other bad stuff in there, they love it. I mean, they're just like, they, they're like, uh, you know, they're at like Willy Wonka at the chocolate factory. I mean, they are just so happy and they're growing. And not only that, all that other stuff you talked about, you know, the trans fats and all that, I mean, you're just feeding into that. So I think, you know, the combination of probiotics, prebiotics, which, for late terms, fiber, you know, having high fiber uh, in the diet and limiting sugar is yeah. a amazing way to go. And I, my personal recommendation to patients. So when I, I'm a big into intermittent fasting and again, it's, there's a lot of diets out there and people can, can throw shade at intermittent fasting or, or keto or these other things. I think there's a room for, you know, veganism is great too. It's just different. It's yeah. a different mechanism, but in the intermittent fasting, I typically will have my patients as we sit there, order Dr. Fung's book, the obesity code. And oh, I, I say, if you read this book, it's going to literally change your life and the way you think about it. And you're going to be shocked yeah. about the way that the body, if you get into, you know, that 15, 16 hour period of intermittent fasting, you're really, th you're able to throw out that cellular garbage and it just, it jump starts, you know, everything. And so I just want to get back to the, the, the dieting. And, and you mentioned that there's a lot of research now that's coming out on either going into full, you know, ketogenic kind of diet. So for people, lay people out there will know it as a, a kind of an Atkins kind of diet or doing intermittent fasting, which is different. I mean, essentially you're just completely, you know, you're, you're, you're free you know, coffee and water on coffee, water, and tea for, I would say at least 16 hours so that you get into that into that period where you're throwing out the garbage for 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 late term your cells can really kind of uh, regenerate themselves and mitochondria regenerate as well once you get to that kind of 15 16 hour range um can you talk about the 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 uses of those types of diets you did mention it but do you you try to slowly introduce them into intermittent fasting what percentage of the, of and where does it work best i would say what percentage of your your patient population do you try to get on intermittent fasting and and what what conditions do you feel like it's really made the most difference no thank you for that question uh, i think this is a remarkable uh, time in terms of uh, you know introducing you know these lifestyle changes in psychiatry and there's so much neat research that is going on with regard to intermittent fasting in bipolar disorder, in schizophrenia, in depression, in PTSD, and so on and so forth. It is remarkable. And several academic centers are now conducting research. So in the years ahead, we're going to get so much research on stress modulation and also uh, dietary you know, aspects on how you can modulate uh, the neurotransmitters in the brain and uh, ultimately you know, improve the reward deficiency syndrome. I would say that across the spectrum, we see both wellness and illness in our setting, you know, so, uh, and across the lifespan. So, uh, and we typically tend to go with what the data shows us and also then the clinical evidence that we see um, and so forth. So what we have learned is the folks who are in the wellness, uh, you know, a population that uh, essentially are already, you know, they're bought into it, if you like. Mm -hmm. They know that they actually are utilizing all of the technologies such as Newcom to modulate their stress. They're coming in to improve their brainwave activity and move it into more alpha coherence with personalized TMS. They know that it's going to shave off those bad years and improve their you know, focus, improve, improve signal, take the noise away and so forth and who are understanding that the gut plays an important role, so they're constantly making those choices, uh, I think that's a very easy sell, you know, and so forth, it's because they have already gotten into it, and it's just a question of sort of educating them about not overdoing it, and so right. on, and, you know, striking that balance, uh, and so on. In the more, you know, serious population, meaning that 
those who are on psychiatric medications, for example. In them, we recognize that a lot of them might actually already have type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome and so on and so forth. And, you know, there are so many socio-demographic factors that we initially just alluded to um, that are also problematic in terms of access to, you know, the food uh, choices that they can make, as you know, which is, again, a, you know, an entirely different uh, bucket, right. if you like, that you probably are already addressing in your podcast and so forth to bring about those changes so everybody has access to, you know, health foods and so on and so forth and can make that. And I will tell you that I typically tell all my patients that, you know, if you do intermittent fasting, you know, do it for 24 hours, see how you feel and so on and so forth and do one week at a time, you know, maybe you can only do one or two days of it, you know, and so forth, 16 hours or 14 hours and so forth, skip a meal, you know, you've got the one meal a day, folks, you know, OMAD diet. So, you know, and when you take the meal, you know, try and work on yourself, do new calm and other, you know, um, mindfulness meditation, you know, um, um, you know, use those methods in order to see uh, that if you're feeling extreme hunger, then how are you regulating it? And you're not going after the 2000 calorie drink, as you mentioned, and so forth. So you don't break that cycle um, and so forth. Um, and importantly, is to recognize that this is a process that can be introduced over a period of time right. and so on. And that systematically they will get into a fasting focused lifestyle. That doesn't mean they're going to fast all day. That doesn't mean that they're going to basically go into you know, episodes where they're breaking it and not doing it, but they are understanding the value of fasting and educating themselves that that actually is really helping with all the free radicals out there in the body as you mentioned, helping with mitochondria and, you know, the dysregulation that is there, you know, it's an anti-aging strategy, no question about it. And also, of course, you know, addressing the insulin resistance so that you get your sugar levels low enough and so forth. And really promoting healthy, you know, cognition and healthy aging so that your chances of dementia and Alzheimer's and so on and so forth are diminished because you are taking care of it and so forth and you add exercise to it and you add you know other healthy activities and so on and so forth and you're already well on your way towards uh, wellness yeah you know I um I think I would break it down and in, into a couple uh different things with intermittent fasting that you said one I wanted to touch on and and I'd like to repeat it now because I've talked about this on another podcast is the access to good, healthy, clean foods is so difficult in certain demo in certain neighborhoods. I mean, yeah. there, there, there's no stores. And and I talk about this. I've talked about this both on social media and on the podcast in that when I originally started getting into diets for my patients, because I identified this a long time ago, I said, geez, you know what? I see so many patients that have obesity and diabetes. I, I need to be part of the solution and not just say, well, I'll worry about the spine or you got to go somewhere else. Come back when you lost 50 pounds. That's not a solution. That's just blowing people off. And so I started with the paleo diet for my um, patients and, and so many times people would come back and say, doctor, you know, I was doing really well on it, but I cannot afford that grocery bill every week. You want me to do, you know, you want me to do what? All this, you know, good, healthy foods. And to be honest with you, one of the reasons that I started to investigate and look at the intermittent fasting lifestyle was because number one, a lot of times you're eating less, you're even eating less than when you're on paleo, right? Because you only have a certain window, whether it's four right. hours, six hours or, or, or eight hours. And then not only that, you be, and again, I stress the best, the best thing that I believe in what I do is I like to try to stay paleo and do intermittent fasting together. But if you're going to do intermittent fasting, at least there's way more leeway in those hours of what you can eat. Now, again, going and getting the frappuccinos and this and that, then, then, then there's almost, you're, you're really self-defeating what you're trying to do. But if you can at least eat relatively healthy and eat a lower amount in that window, it's an easier thing for people that are socioeconomically not in a good place to be able to do, and hopefully by intermittent fasting, and I know this is really extrapolating, if you start feeling better mentally and you're more healthy, you know what? Maybe you can get that better job. 
Maybe you can turn things around. Maybe you if maybe you've been a writer that hasn't written down a word for three years because you're depressed because of your health, and you start feeling better, and you know, and and you really, really can turn things around. So that I just wanted to make, I just want to reiterate that because absolutely what you said, people have to be really cognizant of that of the socioeconomic part of it because a lot of people don't have access to all these things that we're jumping up and down. Hey, you should be paleo and you should do this and you should go to this, you know, this other, it's sometimes it just doesn't work that way. So we need sources that we can help that everyone in the world, because as physicians, that's really what, what we need to be doing. Now, the second topic that is unbelievably fascinating to me, I get I'm at the, the, when you say Vegas, the vagal nerve and the parasympathetic stimulation, I almost want to get goosebumps about it. It is so important to regulate those two systems and so that they come into balance and homeostasis because we live in this crazy, crazy flight or fight state all the time. It's like we're being attacked, right, by the, you know, I'm just repeating the, the, the proverbial, yeah. the lion. We're always being attacked by the lion or the tiger all day in traffic, answering emails, Oh my God, my social media, what did that guy say? And then your family calls you and then patient, it, it's it's for all of us, we're living in this crazy fight or flight. So we need to take the time to, like you said, and you did it, you did the, the hand motion, bring it down and get into that, into those parasympathetic and those other, you know, waves, those alpha waves to get ourselves in balance. If you continue to stay off balance like we do for so long, the body becomes sick. You are turning on the genes of sickness. We are literally thinking ourselves sick. Another one of my favorite, you know, phrases to 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 paraphrase Joe Dispenza. He said, you know, constantly thinking ourselves sick. Right. And so two two things. One, I want to get one, I'd love to get into how you get involved with Newcom. Something yeah. I use, by the way, every single night I listen to Newcom. I do the eight hour mod. I mean, I only sleep for four or five hours, but disc, yep, yes. you have your Newcom disc on. I do yes. it every night. I, I do my Newcom. So I want you to talk a little bit about that. But then I also would love your uh, your your take on vagal nerve stimulation. And if you're using any of that in your practice, because I've had new now that I'm in the wellness space as well, I've had numerous practitioners call me and try to get me into utilizing vagal nerve stimulation in our clients when they come to the wellness centers. And now we're actively looking at it because I was like, geez, you know, between if what, what if we use Newcom and we do some vagal nerve stimulation. I mean, we can we really, you know, like jumpstart their parasympathetic system. Sorry, your floor is oh, yours. Thank you. No, you know, it was just making me smile when you talked about the lions, the tigers. And I was just thinking in my mind that actually the lions and the tigers have become afraid of us now because we are so stressed out that they look at us and they are stressed out. So they run away, you know. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Um, so the reality of the story is, when was the last time you saw a lion or a tiger? They're all hiding from us, you know. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a great point. <laughs> so the reality is, uh, we are so stressed out and uh, that we look like those stressed out lions and tigers. And the lions and tigers are, in fact, during COVID, they were showing some videos in countries where, you know, the lions and tigers were hiding they were actually on the streets. In India, they were on the streets, the leopards and everything else, because they suddenly were not seeing these stressed out human beings. They were having a ball, you know? <laughs> so I just look at it and say the challenges. And to your other point about diet, you know, I live in Southern California, so we have an abundance of avocados. So I always say, you know, yes. um, they are expensive and so forth. But at the same time, as you know, it's really you know, good fat and so on. So I always tell them, if you can, you know, take some avocados, break your fast with an avocado, you'll feel full, you know, and so forth. And do you good for your brain and so on and so forth. I tell them about doing a smoothie. It's not, you know, you just add whatever, if you have almond milk, or if not regular milk, or if not just add water and make a smoothie out of it and so forth. And so you can alternate between eating an avocado, a few nuts, and so on and so forth, yes. if you don't have any allergies and so on, and that will help you with your brain because you're trying to add the brain rich food that you can afford, but at the same time, you're making it a, a practice for you. So in fact, in our practice, 
that's the very least we actually uh, give out to everybody and so on. And we ask on a weekly basis because we do the EEGs on a weekly basis. We ask them questions. We say, well, you know, an avocado a day will keep the doctor away, you know, oh, and, right. and tell them, you know, tune your brain, tune your life, you know. But now we've added tune your brain, tune your gut, tune your life, you know. So as a result of this, um, we started to really look at why is it that our patients are so intelligent? Human beings are so intelligent that um, that is why the tigers and lions are stressed out, you know, because we're so smart that we are getting on our own way, you know, and so on, because we have no way to basically um, relax a little bit and observe ourselves and so on and so forth. And to recognize that for the finite time we have on the planet, you know, uh, we should not be in such a rush. So I think why I started to look at this was wherever I went, whether I worked in the prison system, the jails, the counties, in private practice, in academia, in working with the veterans, um, and so on and so forth, across the continents, the, the issues were the same. Everyone was on um, a treadmill, and life has become... COVID forced us to re-examine our lives. But if you, you know, if you see two years down the line, we've gone back to the default mode network. We are is, back. Yeah, and, and the tigers are hiding, you know. Yes. <laughs> so so the, the, the reality of the story is that we must take an active and conscious um, decision we have to make to say that let's go back and say we don't want that to happen and so forth. We want our immunities to be strong so that we don't get any COVID, any virus coming and hitting us and, you know, taking us down. So I felt that it was important to actually introduce stress modulation um, 101 for the 21st mm -hmm. century. No matter how much I sat down with patients and told them, close your eyes, start meditating, focusing on your breath, yes and so on and so forth. They would do it for 10 minutes and they would say, I'm not the meditation type doctor. You know, so I started to say, man, I really like this challenge, you know, because I know that I cannot send majority of folks to India to go into a cave. I need to bring India over to yes. this South American lifestyle, including myself. You know, as you know, as physicians, we are very busy. You know, we are juggling multiple responsibilities and so on and so forth. And the regulatory systems are so tightly bureaucratic that yes. um, those are the new tigers of society. <laughs> you know, yes. and so they put so much stress, the electronic health record systems, yes. all the things yes. that stress people out and, and so on. So we work very, you know, closely with trying to say, OK, what are the technologies out there that have the evidence, number one? that have gone through the rigorous research and can actually be done at home and it's take home. Because you see TMS, you'll have to come to our place, you know, photobiomodulation until such a device yeah. becomes easily accessible and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's possible to do it without supervision, neurofeedback, all of this, you'll have to come to, you know, a brick and mortar site, you know, but there is something happening between your visits uh, with us. Life is happening. You know, and when life is happening, there isn't, um, you know, a therapist that you can call 24-7, you know, and so forth. Majority of folks don't have, and I've trained as a psychotherapist, and no matter how much I make myself available, uh, it's not possible to see everybody, and mm. it's not possible to provide one-on-one -on -one psychotherapeutic uh, input for everyone. No one's available 24-7. So you have to have a way to self-regulate the system. This is where the Newcom technology has been such a gift. And I got involved about 10 plus years ago. And I had the good fortune before Dr. Blake Hall Hallway passed away. He was the inventor of the original uh, you know, technology that he was actually using with folks with addiction and veterans with PTSD and, and so forth. And, um, um, and I started to notice that there has to be a way to regulate the autonomic nervous system on a continuing basis on demand. And I think that's the genius of Dr. Holloway's work and the current uh, Newcom team with Jim Poole uh, as the CEO who have really gone you know, forward 
with iterations. You have Newcom 1.2, 2.2, mm. and now 3.0. And we ourselves, and there's a slide related to our own publication that is um, pending, you know, um, uh, you know, review at this point of time. And but we have uh, demonstrated that when we use Newcom with everything else. Even if yes. it's patients are on medications, we are able to wean them off of the medications, decrease the dosage, and so forth. Our results are much better even in serious psychiatric illnesses like major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety, and PTSD, let alone in folks who are well, you know, and who are basically having a stressful lifestyle. So everyone can benefit from using the technology that has two components and I'll make it simple and so forth so that you know the audience can actually go over and read more about the research and look at the testimonials and so on on the Newcom website and so forth. But essentially, if you think about it, you know, you, you alluded to the fact that when we are in the fight, flight or freeze mm -hmm. mode and so forth, and the today's tigers are basically deadlines you know, stressful relationships because we don't give ourselves time and our relationships time, you know, sedentary lifestyle yes. and, um, you know, a very singular focus on goals that need to be accomplished at any cost, you know, and so on and so forth. You know what I'm saying? So That's as a result of which, what happens is that the sympathetic nervous system has been hijacked very early and it stays in that chronic you know, um, state of stress, you know? So it's like the thermostat has been set at a different level and so on. So excessive uh, cortisol in the body, too much of adrenaline in the body, and you're basically stuck in that. And your sleep is, the quality of your sleep has started to decline over the years. You're not even noticing it. Maybe you fall asleep because you're so exhausted, yes. but then you wake up, you're waking up basically feeling unrefreshed. So I started noticing this pattern in all my patients and, you know, and uh, in general society. And I was constantly looking at, you know, solutions. And of course you have mindfulness meditation, teaching that yes. we even developed a meditation course called Tune My Brain, you know, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, I think I said for the jet setting society that we have, you know, which is going both at the speed of light, dare I say, and speed of sound at the same time and so forth. We needed to use, you know, we actually needed to use, you know, a technology that doesn't allow you to have light come into your body and so on and so forth so that you yes. essentially block that. That's why you have an eye mask with it, you know, because it dysregulates you, the blue light and anything else and so forth, number one. The second thing was, that you use sound, you know, and so forth. And that was the genius of Newcomb's original research, which is essentially using the auditory cortex, that is the part of the brain that takes in, you know, sound, right? And utilize that to your advantage by using binaural beats, sound waves, if you like, you know, that will oscillate your brain waves to the alpha and theta quickly. Yes. With four minutes or so. So it doesn't matter. And we experimented a lot with it. We would take random people who looked like tigers and put them on the, you know, um, yeah. gravity chairs and they would all become puppies and the good puppies, you know, behaving puppies and so on and so forth. We would take all these gentle giants, veterans, and so on and so forth, and we would tell them, we're just going to get you to relax and so forth. Are you good? They would say, okay, as long as basically you don't do anything to me and so on. And we would basically put them to sleep, not to sleep, but in that sleep kind of state, if you like, like a twilight state of alpha and theta. The, the intent is not to put you to sleep, but many people right. who are chronically sleep deprived actually sleep through it. And I've had that experience when I have three days in a row working and so on and so forth, and I'll do the rescue protocol of new calm, yes. and I'll just be basically deeply asleep, as you know. So the gist of it was that it's that's one patent, you know, towards basically using sophisticated physics, sophisticated mathematics, and algorithms, and more than three decades of research that went into it at Harvard and elsewhere, 
where cardiologists and others who looked at HRV and everything else in order to look at these binaural beat meditations, mm -hmm. I mean, music, um, you know, tracks that essentially put you down into that alpha theta state and bring down, you know, and put you into the vagal tone. The second piece of it is the disc and that has received so much more of the controversy. But yes. basically, I was in, we were involved originally when the original Newcom 1 and 2 were there when we used creams and supplements and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, the basic understanding is you take any intervention at some mm -hmm. level, it is essentially introducing some form of an oscillatory vibratory component yes. in the body. Whether you take photobiomodulation, whether you take diet, whether you take exercise and so on and so forth, you're feeling different because your vibratory, you know, components are changing. So you can argue that in any supplement that you take, et cetera, at some basic level is changing it at a cellular level. It is inducing electrical activity and changing it. And therefore, there is a resonant frequency for every molecule. Yes. And that was the genius of this second piece of the you know, a biosignal processing disk, which is extremely complicated math and everything else that gets into this little disk. But it gets activated once it comes in contact with your own electromagnetic field. And essentially, it manages to match the resonant frequency of the GABA molecule in the brain. So this is at the acupressure six point. So really, Newcom uses the traditional principles from India, the meditation by using binaural beat meditations and traditional Chinese medicine, but yes. applies Western medicine. It's remarkable that we can actually create this without having to go to India or China, but you can bring India or China to the United States of America in a nice manner and get all your sympathetic tone altered and your GABA, which is your calming neurotransmitter coming on in the brain and so forth on demand in 20 minutes. So you could do a 20 minute and it gives mm -hmm. you at least two hours of restorative sleep. So I just simply think that you get in our method, we look at it and say, that's really our method with regard to recognizing. If you have a serious problem where your brainwave activity has got dysregulated, PTSD, depression, anxiety, and so on and so forth, you probably need magnetic stimulation. Mm -hmm. But you will always also need the body to calm down. Because if you're depressed, you've got PTSD. It's not only your brain and your mind that is racing. Your body is also hijacked, you know, and so forth. So you need your body to calm down. So we never get any patient without getting new calm in our, in our clinic. That's a unique approach because I don't think clinics have started to look at it. They understand it. that They tell people to go and meditate, have psychotherapy, get massages, and so on and so forth. But we actually recognize that only, you know, regulating the brainwave activity will not do the trick. So over time, we started to see that patients would say, you know, I'm not depressed anymore, but I'm very anxious all the time. You know, I'm stressed out. I'm still reactive. You know, I have arguments with my mm, spouse. Yes. That's when we started using Newcom. And then, of course, we started to add the gut-brain components. So now we basically say that most folks will require all three and some other additional augmentations, including psychotherapy, maybe they need a little medication and so forth. So that's the gist and summary of the work that we're doing. But I would say for all of you, I think you should check out and uh, Newcom certainly, and really um, uh, walk around uh, as confident, you know, dolphins as opposed to stressed out tigers you know love it i i think that was that was great that was a great explanation of newcom now i'll just say that i have zero affi affiliation with with new so that my listeners know but i am a i am a user myself and uh obviously my lifestyle as a surgeon although i do a, i mean i i think i lead a pretty good lifestyle as far as exercising intermittent fasting doing these things it doesn't matter i'm a surgeon i have a million other projects going on and so what i've loved about the newcom is that ability to do the rescue 
package in the middle of the day. Now, what is very interesting, I have a lot, I mean, I could talk for, I, I don't, I don't want to hijack the discussion, but one of the things that you talked about is it's kind of equivalent to having like two hours of sleep because you're getting into that type of thing. And what's very interesting about it is, and I found that because I'll do that rescue thing, especially if I have a little time, I'll even do it if I'm at, if I have, if I can get away a little bit at the hospital, I'll just go into a different room and just do it. Even if it's for five or 10 minutes, it's still, it's still beneficial. But what's interesting is that I we also have another technology in our wellness centers, um, and it's called Nano-V, and it's structured water. And what it does is it creates this bioidentical signal. I know you use that terminology, yeah. and it's very interesting because on the structured water, what it does is it, it comes in a format, not to get, like, again, into the science weeds, but you inhale it, and it immediately is ab absorbed, and it helps with protein folding, but what people talk about with this, this structured water is the fact that you feel like you've taken a nap. And so you kind of re-energize. So if you're having trouble finding um, words, if you're trying to write something, or you have to answer a lot of emails or something like that, I always often find myself, and sometimes on Zoom calls, people are like, why do you have that, that, you know, that, that cannula on your face? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm breathing my structured water. Obviously, I'm not doing the Newcom rescue while I'm on a Zoom call. That's, that's not going to work. But it, it, it's interesting how we have these tools to be able to put people. So for example, when the tiger threat goes away, right? You go in the room, the tiger's there. Oh my God, you run out. The tiger's not there anymore. There is no tiger, but we stay in that. Newcom allows you to get back into, okay, back to normal. Okay, I'm just yeah. going to go over here. I'm just do whatever I need to do. But you're not in that tremendous state of, oh my God, the world's going to end. I'm about to die. And that's how people feel. They have this impending kind of sense of Ooh. doom. And I like the way that you say that you use it adjacent to these other modalities. And that's something that like the westernized medical mind, I'm, I'm going to scream from the top of the tallest building until people start listening. And that is these things are not mutually exclusive. If somebody needs high level treatment in any other way, that doesn't mean that you don't want to use other tools that can help you. They can work together, especially in those more resistant cases, as opposed to people that are just doing it for wellness that are overall reasonable. They don't need those advanced things, but people that do, you need these other tools. So another, another thing, and this is off topic, but we've found with our wellness centers that some of some people feel that we're kind of stepping on their toes because we're doing it different than what they're doing. So in musculoskeletal health, for example, you might think of something like other things like physical therapy or uh, occupational therapy, things like that. We do class four laser therapy, which is amazing for those things. I mean, you can have tremendous decrease in inflammation and swelling and, 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 and improve pain. Isn't it better if we improve pain with class four laser therapy, and then they can actually do the strengthening work at physical therapy. They are not mutually exclusive because just because yeah. we're decreasing inflammation in a shoulder doesn't mean it doesn't need to be strengthened. It's very difficult for people to strengthen the shoulder. If they're in severe pain, if as soon as you move a shoulder, they're screaming in pain, you're not going to get anything out of that. There, there, nothing is happening. And so I think that we need to start thinking, and you've said this numerous times in this discussion, about these parallel tracks where we really, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach to these people, whether it be in using Nucom with psychotherapy or using it with, with transcranial stimulation or using a laser therapy to decrease pain so that people can do their, you know, their strengthening work. And it's, it's really fascinating how these things all work together. So that was just one thought. Cause I, it's it just so clear that we all need to, I mean, it's like, can't we all get along? We need to. <laughs> because these silos, these crazy silos, like only this works or only this works or that thought, some of these things, like, for example, transcranial, mag and I know you have this, I know you have this experience, even though it's FDA approved. I'm sure you see patients that ask doctors that are not familiar with this technology about utilizing this yeah. particular thing, especially in wellness, not in like severe resistant depression. I just people that just want to feel better and their doctors just or doctors or whoever they see, they're like, that does nothing. That doesn't work. That's not proven because they they, they they don't understand. And then and sometimes we feel like, you know, we're fighting these uphill battles. And I'm sure that's frustrating for you, like it is for me, as we're going outside of 
quote unquote traditional, you know, medical care that we were taught when we went to school. One one other point, because I want to get to concussion, because it's fa- that's a topic that 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 I love. But it's so interesting. We can get people into these more calm states, these sim- these parasympathetic states. With, for example, you're doing it with the biurnal beats, right, and doing that. But there's also light treatment. Some photobiomodulation can certainly relax you. And -hmm. then the vibrational component, which we are bringing into our wellness centers, are fascinating. I tried this this device a long time ago. I don't remember what it was, but I did a combination of the music, like the sound therapy, light therapy, where there was like this strobing light and vibrational therapy. I was out in five minutes. I was they had to wake me up. I was done because of my, you know, I'm in a this state of always, you know, doing something. But it's so amazing how quickly they put me into that. I mean, they just dropped me into Alpha and just in, in the tiniest, tiniest thing. But the nice thing about Newcom, it's so easy. You put your, you know, put your mask on your yeah. disc. Good, you're good to go on your phone. I have it right here and, you know, on the phone, and and I love it. And it's just a tool. That doesn't mean that that like fixes all your problems in life, but it's a tool to help you to do those other things so that you're more calm and more refreshed. So you can think better because when you're in those states, you're in a flow state, you can you can get other things done. Anyway, t- concussion as we're I mean, concussion is something that I've become a, a just just a huge is kind of a, a geek on concussion. I don't know a better word, but I've been reading everything I can on concussion. Just there's so little that we know in the scope of things, but just kind of the way it works, disruption of mitochondrial function, what the treatments are, the fact that we haven't made a lot of progress. So does we have, but not in the mainstream. I think in clinics like yours, you're doing wonders for concussion, but a lot of people are still going down these traditional paths that are the same as they were in 1977. They're not, they're not doing, I mean, just brain rest and being in the dark and having blue light glasses. Yeah, that's going to heal if, if you're lucky enough to heal. But what about all these chronic concussions that even I'm picking up in my clinics now after three or four years, it's very, it's, it's frustrating. So I'd like to talk to you. I'd like you to talk to the audience a little bit about your experience in, in treating concussion specifically with the transcranial magnetic stimulation and what you've seen. And then I want to talk to you about some combination therapies and just some thoughts that I have about what the future might look like in, in concussion management. But I'd like to hear about the way if I came in with a concussion, what would you, how would you help me? Yeah, thank you for that. You know, and to your point about, you know, you discussed about um, so many of the changes uh, that have come about in the last, you know, couple of decades. They've not been incorporated in clinical practice, even though, Some of them are FDA approved, not necessarily for a specific indication and so on and so forth, but there's increased evidence related to that in several other areas, number one. Number two is that if they are FDA approved, they're not being taken up in the same way as they should. For example, TMS was approved in 2008 and it's 15 years and so on and so forth. So you would think there would be TMS clinics all over the country and so forth. We know, and you know, we have the guidelines that tell that TMS does work. There's plenty of data related to that. And all insurance companies have approved it at this point, including Medicare and so on. So there should be enough propagation related to that. But to your point about how can we bring about the transformation in larger populations. So you take a public health perspective on it, you know, whether it is related to the metabolic syndrome crisis, or it is related to the current opioid epidemic crisis, or it's related to overall stress and anxiety and depression and PTSD. I think that we have to, even, you know, um, smaller clinics um, like ourselves and your clinic and so forth, we should collect data because we have so much artificial intelligence now available. Yes. And so very early on, I thought about this and, you know, most academic centers, you know, very interested in affiliating with academic clinics and so forth, because their residents and so forth, medical students get an exposure to what it is out there in the community when they graduate out, because not everyone's going to stay in academia. Not everyone's going to go to the industry. They are all going to practice and so forth. So, forth. so we have multiple affiliations with nurse practitioner programs, mm. PA programs, 
DO programs, MD programs, residencies, and we openly encourage folks to come and do internships with us. At any given time, believe it or not, we have 10 interns and oh, so forth oh. who are rotating with us and so on and so forth, visiting with us, because I just simply think that they all need to get exposed. So I kind of think about it from a broader perspective that the paradigm of how teaching was conducted in a didactic fashion, in a school fashion, and so on and so forth, changed a lot over the years and will continue to evolve. But now with telemedicine and post-COVID and so on and so forth, so much of the training has changed. So these two components of research, that means that we collect the data and we publish and we present, even if we are a smaller center. So one of the slides um, um, that I shared with your team was with regard to our poster at the Society for Brain Mapping and Therapeutics. Um, I'm a board member of the World Brain Mapping Foundation, and it's, believe it or not, run by a wonderful neurosurgeon, Baba Khatab, and it brings together the only society that brings together neurosurgeons, neurologists, psychiatrists, spine surgeons, psychologists, and, um, you know, a basic scientists, computational neuroscientists from all over the world, being held for 20 plus years, and I didn't even know about it until a few years ago, and now um, we have an active psychiatry subsection, and so forth. And we basically present posters in that interdisciplinary format so that we get more ideas related to yes. conditions like uh, concussion and TBI and so on and so forth, because surgeons are seeing them, military medicine folks are seeing them, psychiatrists, psychologists, and um, you know, computational neuroscience folks are measuring things and evaluating them. Yes. So we have you know, started to encourage and and I always reach out um, to uh, clinics and so forth and say, come and present your data, you know, and be out there so that people can actually, you know, sort of really acquire more knowledge and understanding of it. And the education part has to happen too, so that, you know, more students um, start to get exposed to these new cutting edge uh, developments and start to do the research in order to collect more data, because that is a very important part of overriding the skepticism uh, with providing the evidence that science today demands, you know, and so on. So uh, I think that that continuing collection has to happen in addition to the utilization in clinical settings uh, uh, from a translational standpoint. Now switching over to your question related to the concussion piece of it. Early on, you know, when uh, we started, I started my career, I would see a lot of patients because as you know, we share with uh, neurology, our board, it's American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. Mm -hmm. And then when I did my boards with American Board of Addiction Medicine and so on, and now ABPM, um, we would see a lot of folks who had addictions, basically they've had concussions. Yes. And we would see a lot of folks with PTSD and depression, no matter how many antidepressants and mood stabilizers in particular, because with concussion and TBI, whether it's minor or major, comes mood dysregulation, anger episodes, you know, and so forth, classified or misclassified, if you like, for want of better testing and so forth, as bipolar disorder, you know. Right. And so now you're putting them on all sorts of medication. Nothing is working because if you don't, I mean, this is where, the electrical activity component has become so fascinating. And with um, Dr. Blum and um, uh, Dr. Dave Barron and Dr. Murphy and so forth, there is retrospective data you know, published related to concussion. I'll share that paper uh, using personalized repetitive PMS in combat military veterans. And this is very important stuff because we started to say, well, you've got neuroimaging that clearly oftentimes doesn't show much and so on and so forth, unless you did uh, sophisticated spec scanning and so on and so forth, you know, uh, that is still not mainstream. So when you do EEG, spectral EEG analysis, you start seeing patterns because we know that the brain does slow down in TBI and concussion. Mm -hmm. It moves more to the delta, you know, a zone. So in concussion, you see patterns related to, you know, slowing down of the brain wave activity. Mm -hmm. So that's number Second thing is a lot of them actually have sleep apnea and sleep disturbances. That's the other part of it. It seems like there's a core problem with the reticular activating system that goes off when, with TBI and concussion. Uh, the third thing is that a lot of them end up, if they're particularly being in military combat and so forth, they end up with multiple surgeries you know, and so forth, whether it is replacement of, you know, the spine, you know, structures, or it is cranial and, and so on and so forth. So what happens is 
that they also concurrently have pain, you know, that either predated their injury or postdated it and so on and so forth. So now what is the other thing that goes with all of this? Oftentimes is they're on spinal cord stimulators or they're on some sort of a fentanyl and so on and so forth patch and this, that, and the other that also slows the you know, brain wave activity. You see what I'm trying to say, uh, Dr. Stefano? So we started seeing this and of course, now they're depressed as well because they lost their robustness in life. They can no longer function. And oftentimes they're on some workman's comp or some other litigation and so on and so forth. That's stressful too. And cognitive impairment that comes with concussion and TBI is profound and it causes disability and so forth. And then you're on pain meds on top of it. So that makes your brain foggy. So you have a real, how should I say, hot puri of things that is happening at this time, the moment you have. So you have mild concussion that might be a sport-related injury in a young teenager and so on and so forth, who no longer is able to get those A's in his class and the parents bring them to say, this is what happened and so on and so forth. Two, someone who's in military trauma and so on and so forth has multiple concussions over a period of time. They just woke up, they never were in coma, they never got hospitalized, they never had an MRI and so on. They just were told, just get up and go. And they did it two, three times. And now basically they've had micro injuries over a period of time. They can't even remember. So, and then you have sport ski injuries. And so forth. we had one wonderful, you know, um, a lady who essentially had a ski lift or something, you know, pop over head and so on. And ever since after that, for one and a half years, you know, she just couldn't think straight and so on. And her relationship was off. A neurologist was very, you know, forward thinking and had thought to and said, you know what, I think you need to have TMS because none of wow. these medications I'm giving you is going to work and so on and so forth. And she found other uh, facilities who said it's, it'll be a relative contraindication, this, that and the other because the metal and so on and so forth. And surprisingly, we did the low amplitude, low frequency, personalized uh, repetitive TMS. Mm -hmm. We did the EEG and you could see it six weeks later, she was doing better clearer, depression, anxiety, PTSD, all those scores got better and so on and so forth. So all I will say is that, again, we have to, I think, approach it from an interdisciplinary perspective and yes. we have consistent TBI. We have to communicate across board and be able to pick up the phone and call everyone and so on and so forth. Once all of the organicity is ruled out, then I feel that it's the same multi, you know, integrative approach yes. where we have to recognize that a TBI concussion patient is stressed out and they need to be able to do more new calm. And, you know, in fact, the FBI, as well as the US Air Force, they're all users yes. of new calm. Yes. Yep. And the new calm research folks will tell you they've been busy collecting data for the last decade or plus with regard to, you know, improved performance and everything else in the military and the FBI and the first responders. So I guess that it is, again, a brain gut body approach that will give us better results in conditions like concussion and TBI. Yeah, I mean, a great answer. I think this, so the more I, I've been thinking about it, I spend a lot of time thinking about concussion. It's it's interesting, you know, one of the, the first thing I'll say is I can't believe how many concussions I'm now picking up in the last year that I've gotten more into concussion. Why? Because I'm asking the questions on all these people that have had motor vehicle accidents where they've never even been diagnosed with a concussion. But if you ask them the questions, they clearly have they're clearly concussed. That's why they're depressed. That's why they're anxious. That's why they're, you know, restless. They have all these different symptoms. So I'm, I've lately, I've been picking up concussion after concussion. It's not because I'm some genius physician. It's because I actually asked the question. You're not going to pick up anything unless you ask. And I think it has to be part of the regimen. I actually just did a post on that on LinkedIn talking about the fact that we have to look for it because it's everywhere. We don't even have a clue how many concussions are out there. That was part of another podcast I did because it's so frequent and we even even minor impacts can lead long you know can yes. lead long standing marks. Awesome. It's fascinating to see. And that's why the people don't associate their injury because they're like, oh I just knocked my head. I just it just I just hit the corner yeah. of something. And then meanwhile, that's why they're in a brain fog. That's why they're because the, the brain is no longer working well. And and obviously in sports, right, people don't even want to report it. 
because they yeah. want to keep playing and they want to hey. downplay it and coaches, everybody downplays it in sports. Yeah. That's a well-known phenomenon. Yeah. But what I was going to say is what's really fascinated me. And I think it's, it's, I like being an outsider in the concussion space because I'm just looking at it literally like I'm in eighth grade and I know nothing about any of this stuff. And I'm just like, okay, let's just think about what the buckets are. So what I've learned in this research, you know, quest that I've been doing like kind of last couple of years now that I've been thinking about it is one, there is one pathway that we can start looking at some of these new ideas to actually heal the injured brain, which is a little different. That's the physical and that's where the beautiful research that is coming out of Harvard in that 2021 paper that showed healing on functional MRIs of the white matter tracks was amazing because it correlated with the patients improving in symptoms versus sham, right? So that is like, if you can shine a light on the brain through near infrared, right, that penetrates the skull, even though a small part of it gets through, if those injured mitochondria get better, that's one. We can also heal the brain by healing the the gut, right? Because it's all about mitochondrial healing. If you can heal the mitochondria and the neurons, where they're most plentiful, actually, in the entire body, right, in the in the brain cells, then that's the physical. But then the exciting thing is, and you touched on it, the problem is it's like being like on an island, right? Everybody, let's just say everybody's sick. And everyone just gets dropped off on this island and they don't and they're just sick. They're all just laying there. Even if you heal them all, right? From like from the other thing, they don't know how to communicate with each other because they don't know who they, they they have no idea. They don't know. They haven't wired together yet. So they have to learn that. So I feel like doing this transcranial magnetic stimulation and and some of the other things, right? Like biofeedback and everything, it trains. It re jump starts. It trains them and how to be a society again and to work more functionally. And also, then you put the psychotherapy on top of that. That's a little bit yeah. different because there's just a little different component that that takes into different accounts. But I'm really looking forward to looking at studies. So one, we look. We one I talked about with Dr. Nussbaum. You know, my partner, the neurosurgeon, he has this device. It's kind of a biofeedback glove looking at combining that with transcranial uh, um, light therapy and seeing if that's even more effective than than it alone. But it'd be fascinating to see, can we look at the physically healing the brain and also improving the electrical stimulation, doing those together? What about photobiomodulation with transcranial, you know, magnetic stimulation? That might that might be one of the that 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 study could be to me like that it, it is uh, chilling. I get chills thinking about yeah. doing that study. Uh, I feel like that is the money there. Yeah. What do you but think? What do you think because, about? Yeah, I think your next podcast might well be wellness at the speed of light and sound. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, Ab um, absolutely, uh, absolutely. I mean, and then yeah. just, it, it's just it's just such a fascinating thing concussion because it's so many people are so disabled by it and by the way thank yeah. you for what you do in your work your center i've read a lot about your center it looks fascinating and certainly if i see people that are really and they're willing to come out there and stay there for six weeks they need i mean they absolutely you know kind of need to get out there you know and as we start you know wrapping things up and clearly we're going to need to do another one of these because i i don't think i got to about i got about 50 percent of what i wanted to get because you're just such a wealth of information and knowledge on the addiction front obviously you're at the forefront of addiction medicine together with some of the colleagues and things that you're uh, working what results have you seen in addiction and utilizing you know your methodology as research wise, what does the data show on transcranial magnetic stimulation and, and improving the addictive brain? Thank you for that question. You know, I think uh, it's interesting how there's so much overlap amongst all of these disorders, as you can see. Yes. Of course, we have for practical reasons and as science advances and, you know, clinical work advances, we have to, you know, create these buckets. But if, hopefully, the world we are moving towards personalized medicine. And so when all that comes in with genomics and, you know, with the ability to essentially, you know, measure electrical activity 
and measure microbiome at the same time and so on and so forth, we'll be able to impact much more, you know, in a much more precise manner yes. and so forth with minimal side effects or none at all and get people onto the wellness journey. And that's where the future is. But with addictions, if I had to say, I'd say it's the hijacking, as Dr. Blum says, of the you know, reward system, essentially, you know, so that's hijacked, you know, in multiple ways, as I'd mentioned about that particular slide where it talks about the body never lies, which is essentially, you know, any insult, which whether it is an emotional insult or a physical insult or, you know, sexual trauma and so forth, uh, or a combination of factors mm -hmm. can actually create those epigenetic changes. And it puts you on a different trajectory. Um, and of course, you might have a genetic predisposition because we know that there is a lot to be said about genetics in particularly in alcoholism and several other disorders and so forth. Mm -hmm. You have that loading. But, you know, unless it's triggered, right, uh, it's unlikely that the gene will express itself. So the environment, as you as you alluded to very early on, contributes immensely. The access to, you know, uh, illicit drugs, for example, right. the easy access, uh, dare I say, to illicit drugs is a huge problem, you know, in societies where they don't have the access, the prevalence of um, opiate uh, deaths and so forth is less, you know, and so forth. The other part of it, of course, is the availability of treatment centers. Treatment centers need to be able uh, to address this from a biopsychosocial spiritual perspective an mm -hmm. integrated spectrum. So a lot of the treatment centers, in fact, only take on one uh, kind of a model. It could be they have an abstinence model or they just have, you know, a medication assisted therapy model and so yes. on. And so forth. They may not have the resources and they may not have been trained in order to integrate a lot of um, the components because they also have to, you know, sort of run the, you know, setup and so on and so forth. So they have to integrate what insurance providers are covering. There's that piece of it as well. So we have been very fortunate because we are in some ways in a place like in Palm Springs where we have a lot of addiction treatment centers and so forth. So we are able to educate them about the role of, you know, transcranial magnetic stimulation, new calm, probiotics and integrative approaches and so on and so forth. And since people, you know, step down from detox and residential to partial program and intensive program and sober livings, they could stay up to three to six months in a particular location. We have a captive audience that we are able to then, you know, present. So we have taken an innovative approach to basically go to them and make the presentations and so on and so forth and use testimonials. You know, nothing speaks better, as they say, you know, Absolutely. Uh, than a testimonial of a real human being with their experience speaking about this and so forth. And um, I would say one last thing in this, that as we have started to measure the electrical activity and develop the standardized questionnaires and so on and so forth, we noticed that with the help of, you know, gentle stimulation with personalized repetitive TMS, we're able to decrease the cravings. We are able to, you know, improve the sleep patterns because a lot of them essentially with that lifestyle, the lifestyle itself, dealing with drug dealers, going in and out of jail, you know, and uh, trying to base and being out of employment is causes PTSD, you know, of course. And so, right. So we approach it in the same way as we would approach anyone else to say the body is intelligent. It's been hijacked. It's in a sympathetic overdrive. New calm them, calm that body down, get them back into health with good diet and so on and so forth, and bring the healthy bacteria back and then gently stimulate the brainwave activity. Hopefully we'll have more data related to light stimulation. We are thinking about introducing photobiomodulation. Uh, thanks to Dr. Dan Sippel, who has really provided some of the important information related to it and so forth. So we are seriously looking into that and so on. So I think again, with regard to that um, entire crisis, we have to take an integrative approach, and I think we'll be able to make a dent in the epidemic. I, want, I mean, that's wonderful. You know, the opioid, I mean, I talked a lot uh, with uh, Dr. Bloom about the, the opioid crisis and, and what a disaster it is. And again, thank you for, you know, people like yourself that, that are, you know, at the forefront of treating 
th this this disaster some of which by the way is is a uniquely western problem because of the uh, availability of opioids that are coming out of our own systems that needs to be addressed desperately it's being addressed but it 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 can't happen fast enough because again people are susceptible to it you give it to them and you don't know that's why i'm excited when dr bloom's kind of customized approach of looking at the GARS test, right? Yes. And then just doing the genetic risk. Because me as a spine surgeon, those are people that you might say, you know what, I'm sorry, you cannot even have one pill because it could end up ruining your, so it, it. it is, and and forget the, everyone's worried about, oh, you know, you're prejudicing again. No, no, we're saving people. You're not there's certain things that you want to know before you get people down the road. And it's certainly there's so much we can do on that front. And we could talk about the opioid crisis and how to handle it for for hours. The thing that is has inspired me on this talk and when you just gave that that kind of the last thing is the conversation that we are having now, the way that we are thinking about it. And again, we're just too, too, you know, too, too and yeah, you know, how many tens of thousands of physicians in the country, but these are the discussions. These, this is the way that people need to be thinking about it in discussing all these different multiple modalities that are available, right? Some of which are FDA approved for it, some of which are FDA approved in general, but not for a specific indication that we are using off label as physicians because the data is already i mean the data is there yeah. it's very clear and yeah. it's not being out enough but my excitement is that we're having this discussion my frustration is that many of our colleagues are not thinking this way i'm just i, I don't i'm not picking on anyone i'm not doing anything listen i could go back and pick on myself from a couple years ago i could just say hey that guy right if we could go back in the future, I'd pick on myself. I'm not trying to pick on people. All I'm saying is that when people, and when when you are a, a physician or provider or whatever, whatever you do, a nurse, help, anybody that comes in contact with these people that need help, we need to really start thinking on a much, much broader scale about what is really available out there. And we need to educate ourselves, the public, the medical community, and frankly, anybody that'll listen on the fact that there is so much available and we cannot be fixated on these seven drugs that are being pushed repeatedly on every commercial and billboard that we see. That's not gonna solve the world's problems. It is gonna take this multi-faceted, multimodal approach for a very complex society that we live in. It's It's not, it's not easy. I love that you you keep talking about going and meditating and you know in the caves. That would be wonderful. I'm sure if we all did that, you know, you do that three months, you feel great. And we come back, yeah. we're like, oh my God, life is great. Everything's amazing. That's not reality. That's not the world we're living in. So I am I, I've been tremendously inspired by my conversation with you. These are the conversations that honestly need to be happening in every corner of this country and every country frankly, in order to make a change and make a difference in what we are doing to help humanity and to help and, and just to help people to live better lives and not be sentenced to 30 years of metabolic dysfunction and just being sick because there's no point. It, it just isn't a point. And then it, it, we see it all the time. So on, on that note, doctor, how if people want to find you, what are the best ways that they can locate you? And if they're really interested, if there's providers watching this, which I, I'm sure there'll, there'll be some that that watch this as well, if they're interested in getting somebody to your center for treatment, how how could they go about um, you know finding? What are all the ways we can we can get to you? No, thank you. And uh, you know, before I sort of say the last word on how we can be accessed. I really, first of all, want to thank you for this wonderful podcast. I had a delightful time. I hope we can come back with more data and so forth and, uh, you know, educate even further because we have more evidence related to the work that we are doing. I hope that you would continue to do at your hypercharge clinic and so forth, collecting more data related to it and that we could collaborate and spread the word about these treatments across the world and so forth in the years ahead. I would also say to your point about... Uh, the fact that you have excitement and you have frustration. And the way to address your frustration is simple because you're already doing this podcast. So that's one way. And the other way is your new calming away. So that's the second way. Yes, and absolutely. hypercharge your way. That's your third way. And I think you should do more and more of these podcasts and invite more folks because 
social media is the weapon and so forth to address some of this and so on and so forth, misinformation and, and so on, and to educate more of the folks. And, and I'm so uh, delighted and, you know, proud of the fact that you're doing it and, you know, coming from the surgical world and addressing wellness and, and so forth in a big way. And so congratulations and all the best uh, with what you're doing and, and so forth. Uh, it will be such so a much. pleasure to come back, um, you know, in time. And as far as the audience and anyone uh, wanting to reach us, um, uh, we also have a foundation which we started in honor of my mother's memory and her resilience to overcome uh, mental illness. Uh, it's called the Cinder Foundation and it's uh, cinderfoundation.org. And our focus in, is on arts and mental health, public policy and mental health and sciences in mental health. And uh, we support many causes uh, and so forth and uh, encourage folks to come and visit the website and uh, connect with us. Our practice is located in lovely Palm Springs, uh, California, year around uh, we have a lot of sunshine and so forth. So vitamin D is freely available with no charge and so forth. And it's um, it's a very simple website, karmadocs.com. We believe in good karma. So it's K-A-R-M-A-D-O-C-S.com and karmatms.com, K-A-R-M-A-T-M-S.com. So, you know, you could never go wrong coming and uh, touching base with us. And we're always available and uh, we're happy to educate. We're happy to collaborate and we're happy to help you in your healing journey. Thank you. That, that, that was wonderful. I just have to say, you know, one more word on us as physicians having the ability to be on social media, to be on podcasts, speaking with each other, strategizing, thinking about ideas so that everybody can hear what we're talking about, not just us preaching to the choir at these meetings that we go to. The power, it's so in incredible because people are turning to social media, but they are frankly turning to lay people who I will give them credit because there credit. are a lot of lay people out there on social media who have educated themselves tremendously well. and making us look bad sometimes as physicians because they have such a wealth of knowledge. But it is difficult sometimes to cut through the noise because people don't really know who to listen to. So I think us taking the torch, taking that like, like that Olympic torch and just saying, you know what, as physicians, we're going to take the power back in our hands. We want you to trust us as a just kind of a general population. We are going to bring you things that are scientifically vetted, proven and things like that. And we'd like them to rely on our expertise, our non-biased, I mean, really looking at it as scientists and saying, listen, we are doing this for you. We're trying to make things better. But if we're not out there and we're not the ones that are doing it, people are going to get their information from others that have not spent their literally their entire lives dedicated to the practice of medicine or whatever, you know, whatever providers are, you know, are doing out here, science or nursing or or, or whatever. They're going to just turn to their local person, the hairdresser, their bar, whoever, people that yeah. like, honestly, they're very smart people and they're learning this stuff. But we have to be the ones that take very complex information like you did on the show yeah. and put it in a way that people can understand what is transcranial you know, stimulation? How do we treat concussion? How, how do we do this? And on that note, I'm actually having, I, I can't say the name, but I'm actually having one, uh, a physician who is without question a celebrity on social media and the entire discussion is going to be related to how do doctors do what this person has done to get themselves in the spotlight so we have a voice so that we can educate and teach and put people in the right direction to try to help them to overcome a very challenging and difficult world that, that we live in today that's only going to get more challenging. So again, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm very fired up, and so I probably need to do a, a Newcom rescue package because you got me real fired up on, on the show right now. And I look forward to having you back and collaborating actually quite a bit uh, as we go forward, because there's so much overlap between what we, we are all doing here 
uh, in trying to help the general population. So again, thank you so much uh, for coming on. I hope that everybody makes the decision to listen to this podcast and listen to what you have to say in its entirety. And until next time, everybody, thanks for watching episode nine of Wellness at, at the Speed of Light with Dr. Sunder. It's been an absolute pleasure to have him on, and I'm sure you'll want him on again, and uh, we'll see him back real soon. <laughs> <laughs>